Good morning and welcome to church, to Pursuit Church. Let us stand for our call to worship. Psalms 34, 8 through 10 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we are, Lord, to worship you this morning, Father, and to seek you. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit may just come and overflow in this place. Father, we dedicate this service to you, and we invite you, Lord, um, to receive all of the glory and all of the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Open up the doors again Let the King of glory in His kingdom will never end Oh, I know that you are good Break the darkness with the light All the earth let praise arise Every dead place come
would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. morning. You may be seated. Well, welcome to uh, Pursuit Church. So glad that you're here. So glad that you sprung forward uh, this morning. We'll find out if there's anybody that didn't spring forward this morning in about an hour. Um, but uh, glad that you're here. We're here to celebrate Jesus Christ this morning. Amen. It's good to be here. It's good to be here to worship God this morning. And uh, so glad that you're here, whether, whether here in person or online this morning. Well, in the life of our church, we do have different groups that meet during the week. Uh, Pursuit Nights um, meets on Monday nights, and uh, Brian is leading that group of the students. And so that's meeting, I guess, 7 p.m. Monday night right here. And uh, if, if you need to attend that in Zoom, you can also do that as well. And then on Wednesday evenings, we have a Bible study with uh, David in Spanish um, at his house or on Zoom as well. And um, that's uh, it's a great, great study. And uh, Thursday night as well, we're having a good time with the couples. We're meeting here at 6 p.m. We have a little bit of food together. And then at 6.30 p.m., we start a really great uh, video series um, that we're going through as couples and uh, just enjoying um, being with our spouse and uh, with each other as well. So that is Thursday evenings at 6 p.m., here at Pursuit. Well, there are four different ways uh, for you to give uh, to the church. Um, there's, of course, here in person. There's online. You can send a text, and I'm not sure what else. Oh, through the mail, I guess, is the other option. 
but uh, there's four different ways for us to give, and uh, giving is worship. Um, when, we, when we give, we're worshiping the Lord. We're saying that I'm going to obey you in, in that you command me to give to your kingdom on the earth, but also it's worship because we're trusting the Lord um, with our finances. Um, sometimes when it's difficult to give, um, we give anyway, and the Lord, uh, the reward, Lord rewards that. Um, well, let's take some time now to, uh, to pray, and I want to pray for a woman that you don't know, uh, but she does our accounting, and we've, Jenny and I have known her for a number of years, probably 40 years um, that we've known Lois, and she called me the other day, and um, it was a very odd experience because I think she was having a stroke. Well, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, but she was speaking, and she wasn't making any sense. In long paragraphs, she was speaking to me, but they weren't words that I've actually heard before. And so I, I called 911 immediately for her, and they took her to the hospital. And so I'd like to pray for Lois uh, this morning. Uh, just, now, she called me yesterday. She seemed, was able to talk and all that, so it's a good, good sign. Uh, seemed a little confused, but uh, let's, let's just lift up Lois in prayer and and also others within our church that need uh, a healing touch from the Lord. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, this morning just for your goodness to us in Jesus Christ. You have showered and given us abundance of, of grace and, and peace with you and a new relationship. And Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, we pray also for those within our church that need a healing touch. Uh, from you this morning. Um, some are not able to, to walk very well. Some are just struggling with other maladies. Lord, of course, we're, others are in quarantine. And so we pray, Lord, that soon uh, people can get, the, uh, can get the vaccine and that this, will, this, this pandemic will, will go behind us. And so, Lord, that is what we pray. We pray that just not for us, but for the whole world, Lord, that we could as a world, we could put this behind us and, and get back to normal. But Lord, according to your will, according to your plan, you have purpose in everything. Lord, we don't want to return just to normal. We want to return to you. And so, Lord, make that true in our country and around the world, that people would turn to you um, even during this time. But Lord, we, we lift up Lois this morning, and uh, Lord, let your healing hand be upon her body, bring her bring your comfort and recovery um, just in your goodness. Lord, thank you that she knows you and, and loves you and is confident of your, of your touch upon her. And so, Lord, we, we lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite the deacons to, uh, to come forward at this time to receive your tithes and offerings.
May be seated, and the children may be dismissed to their classes. So normally, I don't uh, don't always talk to Carolyn uh, during the week about the music of the service, but she always seems to uh, do a great job of finding the lyrics that go along with the sermon despite that. So I think she has a musical superpower um, that allows her to do that. And I was just looking at the words there, we don't boast in anything except in Jesus Christ. And that's how our sermon is going to end today. Um, 
Well, on Saturday morning, yesterday morning, I did something that I have never been able to do in 60 years of my life. Um, I was humble. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. I'm always humble. Um, that's another joke. But I, what I did is I saw the planet Mercury for the first time. Now, um, how was I able to do this? Well, first of all, I was up before dawn. I was working on the sermon. And I heard that several planets were going to be visible before dawn that morning. And so I grabbed my phone and, um, and I opened up Go my Google Sky app and, uh, well, pointed it at that part of the sky. And it showed that Mercury was there and Jupiter was there and Saturn were there kind of in alignment. Um, and it was still, the sun hadn't come up yet. And so I couldn't find Mercury except that I was, had to look very, very carefully and almost looking around it, I was able to detect, okay, a very, very dim, very, very dim star looking, and that was the planet Mercury. And so it's the first time that I've ever been able to do that. Now, why did it take 60 years? Um, mostly lack of resolve. Okay, I had never just determined that I wanted to see Mercury, and uh, so just lacking the decision to do it, and also, of course, the right conditions had to be in place. So. But there is something in that, um, and I think that much of our difficulty in the Christian life is similarly simply because we do not determine to try. Um, and it's also a lack of imagination that we have. And so how do I mean that? How do we have a lack of imagination in the Christian life? So as we go through these books in the Corinthians, we're going to see that many of their problems were, not, were just lack of resolve and lack of imagination. And uh, certain things had happened to them in their new relationship with God and through Christ that they had really not thought through yet. Um, and those are the things that were affecting uh, their thinking and behaviors. So they hadn't really thought through it yet. So why do I say a lack of imagination? Um, so we certainly don't imply that the Christian life is, in our faith is just imagination. Um, we're not just making this up. Uh, but at the same time, the things, the things in the Christian life are unseen. And uh, we're told to believe in them, and God gives us many means of believing and being convinced of the truthfulness of the Bible, um, and yet we will need to use some imagination. As it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 3, it says this. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So for by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Okay, so faith is the assurance of things that we hope for, the conviction of things that we don't see. And also continuing on in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, <clears throat> it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place where he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So by faith he went to live in the land of promise as, a foreign, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So using some imagination to set out, God told him to do it, but he had to picture himself actually leaving his home in Ur and going out and living in a foreign land. And so they were needing to see some things that were invisible and work out their behaviors accordingly, so they needed to live by faith and imagination. So now it's no different for us um, today. When confronted with moral decisions, we need to consider that God is watching, okay, whether we're watching something on TV or using TurboTax. Um, so we are going to be going through these books of Corinthians, and uh, we're going to explore some of the themes that occur in these books, um, and remember that um, they are in this book as an example to us. That's an amazing thing to think about. That book of Corinthians was written for you. 
God had you in mind when those Corinthians were doing what they're doing, and God chose to have it written down. Listen to these verses. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, to whom the end of the ages has come. But we see that the Corinthians had many failures to live properly. And that is why I have entitled the series that we're going to be going through called Living Badly in the New Age. So we are all living in this in-between space between what God has already done through Christ, what we already have, and yet what we haven't yet received and we will receive in the future. So we live in this in-between space. So if we fail to comprehend and apply our imagination to how we should live life, we will live like the Corinthians, badly. Um, God has equipped us to live a different kind of life than the world around us. So he has called us to be holy, and we say the word holy, it means to be different. God has called us to be different, different kinds of different. So if we don't comprehend that God is calling us to be holy, we can act like those who do not know God. So that is what we're going to be exploring this morning, that God has called us in several ways to be different. So now I've printed the passage um, from 1 Corinthians as your reference. Okay, you should have that in your hands. And I, I want us in this series to be used to looking at the Scripture text. So we need to be people of our Bible used to looking at it for ourselves. Um, and whether that's in your Bible or on a phone app that you have, as we go through the Scripture, teaching and preaching the Scripture, I, I hope that you'll be looking at the text for yourself. It's important. Let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> 1 through 3. It says, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with, those, with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, if you're used to reading the Bible, and particularly Paul's letters, uh, it might strike you that it sounds just like any other letter. Um, he starts off kind of the same. But let's look at it closer, as if we're trying to find Mercury in the morning sky. So Paul says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. So this is an assertion. This is something that is true. It says, we are sanctified, past tense, in Christ Jesus. Okay, so one time I went to the doctor because I had this red bump in my eye, um, and I was worried about it. And so the doctor examined my eye with a scope, and he said, uh, just as I expected, you have a nodular episcleritis. Um, and so now having my complete attention, I asked him, well, what is that? And he said, well, it means you have a bump in your eye. <laughs> so not too, not too helpful. I didn't like paying $80 for that visit to hear that, but at least I had the assurance that it wasn't a big deal. Okay. And so now we don't know, if we don't know what it means at the same time to be sanctified in Christ Jesus, we should also be asking a question. What does that mean? So when we're looking at the Bible, you know, we, you know, if a doctor tells you a technical term, you're going to ask him, what does that mean? Same thing in the Bible. As you're reading through your Bible, if you don't get what it means, dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper. Try to find, do some cross-referencing. Try to maybe look up something online about what the word means. But we need to be students of the Bible. So... If we don't know what it means to be sanctified in Christ Jesus, we should ask, what in the world does that mean? So the word sanctified here is, the Bible was written in Greek, and it's hagiazo, and it means to make holy. So that just leads to another problem that we have, and what does holy mean? And unfortunately, I think it leads us 
to conjure images like this. So uh, here's uh, Saint Monica. We have a Saint Monica in our church. Um, she doesn't look like that, though. And uh, here's another picture of a saint, Saint Nicholas. Um, but I think when we say the word holy, those are the sorts of things that uh, kind of come to our mind, those iconic images of, of saints um, in some church traditions. <clears throat> but the mystery intensifies, and Paul also says this in verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So we are called to be saints. And uh, the question is, is it that kind of saint? All right, well, there's the, the saint on the, uh, your left, the New Orleans saints. And I'm thinking of Brian with this one. It's not that kind of saint that we're called to be. And we're not actually called to be the kind of saint on the right either. Uh, again, those images are not that helpful for us. So, now, I don't want either one of those. Um, but the, the word saint here has the same root word as sanctified. When we're called to be saints, it means that we are holy ones already. God has already done that. He has already sanctified us and made us holy to himself. And so we are already holy. We are saints. And so that's why the Bible says that God calls us to be saints. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when God appeared to Moses, he said to him, he said, do not come near. Take off your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So he, he is saying the ground around you is holy because I am holy, because God is holy. But you are not holy. Moses, you are not holy, and therefore do not come near me. Okay. But Paul is now telling these Corinthian peoples the opposite of that, that you are holy. You have been made holy, sanctified in the same way that the items in the tabernacle were made holy, and that's by sprinkling. They were sprinkled with the blood of bulls and goats. Now, we as Christians are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed him for us. We are sprinkled with his blood, you know, the same way that Old Testament, Old Testament picture was made of what's going to happen to us, and that is that we are made holy by Jesus' blood. So the reason that Paul is telling them this is not just for some religious education, but it's meant to give them confidence that they are and can be in God's presence. God told Moses, don't come near because you're not holy. But God is saying, you are holy. You are welcome in my presence. So how many times do we feel guilty because of our sin um, and we don't want to be in God's presence? So instead of telling us, God, instead of God telling us, take off your sandals for the place that you are standing is holy ground, he is saying, you are welcome, you are welcome in my presence because you are already holy. Now, this is a perplexing thought uh, because we know that we're so sinful. Um, but this next text reinforces this idea. So verse 4, it says, I will give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. He's saying that the testimony of Christ is the preaching of the gospel. It was confirmed in them because they believed it. They believed the gospel. In verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, listen carefully. To verse 8. It says, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so did he hear that? This is really important to hear. The Bible says that we will be guiltless on the last day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that last day of Jesus Christ mean? It means the judgment. And the last day and the judgment before Christ, we will be considered guiltless. Now, that seems as strange as anything to our ears to, uh, to really comprehend that. But 
it must be true. If we are going to be granted life in heaven with God, it has to be true. Because only, only holy saints will be in God's presence. And that's what the Bible is telling you. That if you put your faith in Christ, you are a holy saint right now. And you will be found guiltless. So that's the good news of the gospel that we have. So we think of ourselves and all of our sins, and it seems to be like this great giant debt. Um, let's say it was $100 million. Um, all of that debt that I can never repay, my bank account, you know, is overdrawn by $100 million. I can never repay that. And it's as if all of that debt is put on Christ. So now my bank account is back to zero. I mean, that would be a huge relief, wouldn't it? To have all your debt forgiven, all right? Just to be back to zero. But it's more than that. The Bible says more than that. It says we are enriched in him. All of the riches of Christ are now given to us as well. So now we are billionaires in Christ. All of my debt is imputed to Christ, and all of his holiness and goodness is imputed to me. And that's what the Bible says, Hebrews 4.16. says, let us, then, <clears throat> let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So throughout the Old Testament, there were all these barriers put up around the tabernacle so that people would not intrude into God's holiness. When Jesus died on the cross for us, all of his barriers were removed. It says that the veil in the temple between the holy place and the holy of holies place that the priest could only go once a year was ripped in two. Significant of the fact that we are now have access through Jesus Christ to God's very presence. And that's what this word says. That let us then draw with let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. There are no barriers for you as a Christian that's put your faith in Christ because Jesus has taken all your debt and given all of his riches to you and has made you holy and sanctified in Christ. So we should be confident in going into God's presence. So Paul is telling the Corinthians that they are already sanctified, made holy to God. And called to live holy is, is saying these things so that they can be confident. So our, our theme today is God's calling. God is calling us to several different things that we're going to look at in this passage. Because God has called us and because, because, what, sorry, because of what God has called us and because of what God has called us to, we can live the kind of lives that we're supposed to live. God always calls us to live out what he's put into us. We live out what he's put in. So in this first calling, we, we have to see this. So God called us to be sanctified and to be saints and to have confidence in his presence. So the principle is, is that people that understand God's calling to be saints are confident in God's presence. So in this sermon today, every time we go through one of these principles, I want to stop and pray for you. And so let's take a moment just to pray now as we consider these things that we've just talked about. Lord Jesus, we thank you um, that you provided a way for us to be sanctified, to be made holy, and you've called us to be saints, to live that out. So we thank you, Lord, that we are holy and we are in your presence now because of what Jesus has done for us. Lord, make us confident and let it revolutionize our lives as we live boldly and grow in your presence. Amen. Okay, in verse 9, uh, we see our next calling. Um, it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with his, with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we were also called not only to be sanctified and to be saints, but now we are called to be in fellowship with his Son. So another one of God's callings is to be in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. So we go from one unbelievable thing to the next. First, we are forgiven all of our sins and called saints. Then the Bible says that we are called into fellowship 
with Jesus Christ. We are called into fellowship with God himself. So just like I had to ask the doctor, what does it mean? Um, we need to ask that again. So in 1 John 1, 3, we see this about the word fellowship. It says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So a Christian is called to fellowship with God. And that means to have a friendship, a relationship with God. Unbelievable. So a friendship is something that's comfortable. Um, we, uh, when we have friends, we, we feel comfortable with them to approach them, to ask them how things are going. Um, you know, if we don't know them, we feel a little bit uncomfortable. But our relationship with God allows us, through the Holy Spirit, to cry out, like it says in Romans 8, Abba, Father, or Daddy. And this is because of the disposition that God has toward us as his children. So we're not flippant about this. Um, and we understand that though he is a friend, he's also our Lord. So God has called us into fellowship with himself and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, so the principle here is that people that understand this calling and fellowship with Christ will see all of their interactions with him as a relationship. Pray with me now. Father, thank you for making us your children and uh, to be able to enjoy friendship and intimate relationship with you. Um, we can call you daddy, um, which would, to an ancient Jew, Lord, would be almost blasphemous to have that kind of intimacy with you. But, Lord, that's what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. You've made us your children, Lord, and we just want to say thank you for that in Jesus' name. So as we uh, <clears throat> start in this book of Corinthians from here, um, we are going to go down from here. Um, it's like starting at the top of the roller coaster. You start at the very top, and then we're going to go off that first big hill. And what that means is that we're starting at the top of all the things that they are and have done right, and now we're going to descend into some of their sin, things that they're doing wrong. But God wants us to know from the very beginning that we are loved and we are holy, and that's what the Apostle Paul does in this book. So verse 10, So I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, that's Peter, or I follow Christ. So is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So the Corinthians were having some real problems because they were not living out what God had put into them. And um, so they were not living spiritually um, according to the spirit that was now indwelling within them. And so we're going to explore this in the weeks ahead. And so I'm not really going to explore this passage right now because we're going to look at this book of Corinthians more thematically. I'm not going to, we're not going to just trace through every single chapter in order. I'm going to as we go through Corinthians, it's going to be a little bit more thematic. So if I pass through a bunch of stuff that you know would be really valuable to talk about right now, it's okay. We're going to come back to it. So Paul asks this question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? The answers, of course, are no. But the Corinthians were allowing themselves to be divided. So there may, there may have been teachers within the church that were struggling for some predominance. Um, they may have tried to align themselves with one or the other of the apostles uh, because they felt that it gave them some kind of an advantage um, with the people. 
But the point is the Corinthian saints were allowing themselves to follow one or the other person, forgetting that they should only follow Christ. So as a Christian, we only follow Christ. We don't follow a man. So sometimes I worry and I'm afraid for these people that follow, say, TV preachers or other really famous personalities, because no matter how good they are at preaching or anything else or the message that makes them, how, how it makes them feel, we don't follow men, we follow Christ. And that's why we need to have our eyes on the Word of God and be reading and studying the Bible on our own. So Paul said that Christ did not send him to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And it is by faith in Christ that someone is saved. So when a person stops and tells the Lord, Lord, I am a sinner. I need the forgiveness that Jesus offers me and made possible by dying for me on the cross. When a person puts their faith in Christ, the Bible says they are saved. Um, And it's not some participation in a ritual, even one as meaningful as baptism, that saves a person. But it's put in your faith in Jesus Christ. So Pastor Bill used to say when he baptized someone, he said, if you're a non-Christian, when you go into the water, you'll be a wet non-Christian uh, when you come out. Um, and so in three weeks' time, um, we are going to baptize some people on Easter morning. And uh, if you've never been baptized or would like to learn about what baptism is and why uh, Jesus Christ commanded believers to be baptized, uh, please contact me and we'll talk. So likewise, if you want to know what it means to be saved, please contact me and we can, we can talk on a personal basis about this. So there are a couple more principles as we go through this passage. Um, let's read from verse 18. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who us are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But to those who are called, there's that word called again, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So I think that the Apostle Paul had a very acute sense for how weird the gospel sounded to people. Uh, Many times he would preach, go to a new town, and preach in the square or whatever was there. And I think he had a very acute sense of how strange it must have sounded to people. And I know that he heard hecklers many times and maybe even people throwing rocks and certainly got beat up a lot of times. But he says this, he says, to those of us who are being saved, that weird, strange message is the power of God to us. It's how we are saved. Now, a Jew could not imagine that their Messiah, the one that came to deliver Israel, could be beat up and flogged, and hanged on a cross. It says it right in Deuteronomy 21. It says, he who is, you know, hung on a tree is cursed. They couldn't imagine that their Messiah could be one that was cursed, but Jesus was cursed for us. He was cursed for us. He took our curse and became our curse so that we could become righteousness in God. So Paul knew how weird this message was. But he said to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God knows that to the natural mind, the gospel is foolishness. So if you were a Greek person, um, you might imagine, how could a Jewish teacher crucified by the most hideous means be the answer to immortality? It didn't make sense to them either. Verse 23 and 24 again. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
So the Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if we call out to God, we will be saved. But I can assure you that no one can call out to God unless God calls them. So as it says in verse 24, but to those who are called by God, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we cannot see truth in the beauty of Christ unless God first calls us and wakens our heart. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13, it says this, But we, always, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the firstfruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you also may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God calls people to believe in his Son, Jesus Christ. So, the principle, God has called us to believe a foolish message and through it to know his truth and his wisdom. And so the principle is that people that understand this calling know that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. We know that the gospel message, that God's way of working is wiser, even the foolishness of it is wiser than men. So let's uh, take a moment to pray. Lord, thank you for that you have revealed the truth of Jesus Christ to us and his humiliation, Lord, of descending from heaven and becoming a man and dying on a cross, of having a mock trial and being the Lord of heaven and yet mocked and being spit upon and becoming sin and alienated even from God the Father on our behalf. So we thank you, Lord, for that truth and that wisdom that you revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's continue in verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. <clears throat> God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, are, that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. There's that song we sung. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification. Sanctification is that holy word again. God has made us holy and redemption. <clears throat> So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So another of God's calling is, is to come as we are. Um, so what does Paul say? Not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. Um, but what you were is foolish and weak and low and despised. And so if you are those things, and of course you humble yourself, before God, he will use you to bring to shame or to undo the ways of the world. So in James chapter 4, verse 6, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. So we have to come and humble ourselves to God in order to receive what he wants to give to us. And we do humble ourselves. So who we are and who we hope to become is not of our own doing. It is by God's grace. We are his workmanship. Everything you want to be in your life is going to be because God is working in your life. So we see this in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace we are saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of our works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All of the good works of your life 
God has already prepared those in eternity past for you to live, to know Him, and to walk in those things that He has done. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God in me. So repeating verse 30 again of our passage, And because of Him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So God has called us to boast in the Lord, not in ourselves. And so the principle here is that people that understand this can know that we can only boast in the Lord, not in ourselves. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your work in our lives and the humility that you give us of knowing, Lord, that you're the one that works within us. You're the one that makes us what you want us to be. And so, Lord, we invite you, put your hand on our lives. Change us, Lord, to make us what you want us to be. So God has used the Corinthians um, as an example for us. Uh, We get to see their failures in all the ways that they are, they're going to go wrong um, in, the, in the weeks ahead. And we're going to come to recognize a lot of those same things in ourselves. So God has called them in several significant ways. God builds into us what he expects to get out of us. So first of all, God called us to be sanctified and to be saints, to have confidence in his presence, that he's already made us holy. Okay, God has called us into fellowship with himself, and Jesus Christ. What a privilege that is to be able to have a relationship, a a comfortable relationship with God the Father because we are at peace with Him. God has called us to believe a foolish message and through it to know the depths of truth and wisdom. So God has called us not to boast in ourselves but boast in the Lord. So I'm grateful, once again, for God's grace uh, to use the Corinthians as an example for me. So please pray with me once more. Father, we thank you for this passage that reminds us that everything that you want to get out of us is because you've already put it in us. And Lord, help us to have the clarity of mind to understand that, the imagination that we need to, uh, to work it out, Lord, to work out what you have put into us. And so, Lord, we invite you to to do that. And uh, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand. boast in anything no gifts no powers no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and Well, I hope that uh, you'll hang around a little bit, just get to know somebody maybe that you don't know. That's true even of us that are here every week. Not everybody knows everybody. 
take a step of courage and, uh, and introduce yourself to somebody new. And uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we, we'd like to get to know you. And uh, so hope you'll just hang out for a few minutes with us. Now for the benediction um, from 2 Corinthians 13, I read these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. For the, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet with one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Maybe not during this time of COVID. But all the saints greet you. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Good morning. How are you? Have